The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Glory to you, Lord Christ. At the Last Supper, when Judas had gone out, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man has been glorified, and God has been glorified in him. If God has been glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and will glorify him at once. Little children, I am with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and as I said to the Jews, so now I say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. I give you a new commandment, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be always acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. You know, there are certainly more than enough acronyms that we need to keep track of, but I acquired a new one this week that's helpful this morning. CVD. Compromise. Wait a minute. Something like that. <laughs> it's an acronym that stands for people who are colorblind. People who are born without the ability to discern reds and greens, blues and yellows. People who can only see things in black and white or in gray. I can't imagine what that would be like going through life unable to see the full variety and spectrum of colors in the world, the vibrancy of reds and greens, blues. What a loss that must feel like. Except that people who are colorblind have that condition from birth. So I wonder never having seen those colors, never having seen the world in all of its splendor, do they experience it as a loss at all? You can find them if you look. There are videos online of people who have been given a pair of corrective lenses that allow them to see all of those colors for the first time. And I think their response to those glasses bears out my suspicion that those folks have gone through life unable to even imagine what God's glory and splendor look like to everyone else. They put those glasses on and some of them begin to giggle, to laugh, to cry, to hug the people around them. They're so awestruck by the full spectrum of light love that's in the world that they're brought to tears. They had spent their whole life with a diminished understanding of the beauty of God's creation and the world around them. Peter and the disciples in Jerusalem who he confronts this morning have spent their whole lives with a diminished understanding of the beauty of God's salvation and love and the world around them. They were all faithful Jews and they had spent their whole life being taught that God's salvation, mercy, love, and grace were for the people of Israel only. They could never have imagined that God's grace and love would be extended beyond their own tribe. And so when Peter comes to them and tells them the story of the Holy Spirit bestowing its gifts on Gentiles, their eyes are opened 
to the full beauty that is God and God's creation. Listen to the way that it's described in the book of Acts. When they heard this, they were silenced. They stopped complaining and arguing that Peter had done something wrong. And they praised God saying, then God has given even to the Gentiles the repentance that leads to life. In that moment, they were given corrective lenses that allowed them to see God's light being refracted into the world in colors and wavelengths that they might never have imagined. I don't think it's arguable that we have been taught things since our birth that would give us a diminished sense of God's beauty and God's light and God's love in the world that would keep us from seeing the full spectrum of God's love beyond or maybe playing on our own instinct for tribalism to other people who are different from us, to other people who come from different places, whose skin hues are different, who love differently, who worship and believe differently. The world teaches us that we are in and they are out. All of that plays to the world's advantage, keeping us divided, polarized, separated from one another. And at the same time, it diminishes our comprehension of the full beauty of what God intends for each and every one of us. We have been given that corrective lens and we have the ability to rise above that tribalism and the teachings that are being pressed upon us all the time and to recognize as the hymn we just sang tells us that we are all made one. We have the Holy Spirit to help us be more. Now, how do we discern? Peter said that the Holy Spirit descended upon those Gentiles, and having been given that gift, he says, if then God gave them the same gift that he gave us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I? that I could hinder God. When we stand in the way of people's participation in the life that God longs for for each and every one of us, we are hindering God. So how do we know whether they have the gifts of the Holy Spirit? We could turn to Paul's letter to the Galatians. Chapter 5 gives a list of the gifts or the fruits of the Holy Spirit, and we could test people for these, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. But if that's how we figure this out, we have put ourselves back in the judge's seat. We have taken on responsibility once again for deciding who's in and who's out, and we've fallen right back in to that trap and already the light begins to dim. We lose track of the reds and the greens and the blues and the yellows and things start to become gray. Fortunately, this morning, we hear from Jesus. And this is a bit of a chronological jump. Here we are celebrating the season of Easter, but today's reading goes back to the Last Supper as Jesus is preparing the disciples to live without him. And he says, I give you a new commandment that you love one another. When I looked at that at the beginning of the week, I thought, really, is that new? Is that a new commandment? But what Jesus is saying in this moment is that we are to lay down our lives for our friends. Just as he has loved us, we are to love one another. Now, he's not telling us that we need to die on the cross. When he tells us that we need to lay down our lives, 
He's telling us that we need to let go of that need to differentiate ourselves from one another. That need to, that tendency, that urge to tribalism, that need to say who's in and who's out, to pull out Paul's list of the fruits of the Spirit and start to judge whether people are manifesting them or not. Jesus is telling us that we need to love one another first. And by that, I think he means to assume, to know that the Holy Spirit is active and present in the lives of the people all around us. There's no one at whom we look and whose eyes we can't see Christ Jesus. We said this, these words last week, or you all did, I wasn't here, but you said them with Bishop Lee. We will seek and serve Christ in all persons loving our neighbor as ourselves. It doesn't say discern whether or not Christ is in that person. It assumes that to be the case. And so when Jesus tells us this morning, I give you a new commandment, Love one another as I have loved you. He's reinforcing that baptismal promise that we all said last week. To love our neighbors as ourselves. To seek and serve Christ in all persons. When we do that, we begin to see the full spectrum of God's love God's love refracted into the world through the prism that is Christ Jesus in all the colors that we can imagine and some that we can't. The world is much more beautiful than we know. And the more we can let go of our need to be at the center of our own universe, the more we can love one another as God has loved us, the more we can experience that beauty, that love, and that joy. We have that corrective lens. We have what we need to see all of those colors. And it all comes down to love. Thanks be to God. Amen.